Hey guys, Bugcat7 here. Okay, it is Friday, May 15th, 2020. And I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. Alright guys, well, back to my series looking into the accounts of the quote-unquote giants or large hominids, as I like to call them, state by state. And next up is Oregon. And I'm fascinated by the accounts that we're hearing about from Chris Leslie's site, Greater Ancestors here, where he's accumulated all of these accounts from uh, the states and from around the world, quite frankly. And what's fascinating to me when I'm finding out about the West Coast is that there seems to be or have been a mound builder culture on the west coast that isn't mentioned by mainstream academia and you know when they refer to the Adena and Hopewell um, these are the areas where you know these things are concentrated so it would be you know towards the east part eastern part of the country to the middle almost middle of the country here somewhere by the Mississippi River and no mention of mound building in any other parts of the country even if you look it up and let's say Wikipedia the baloney online encyclopedia they don't refer to any mound building cultures being on the west coast at all so the, the, here's their archaeological culture maps which is what we were just looking at here see and what they're saying is the hope well as we know from current archaeology and anthropology is actually the adena and hope well living together in a sort of uh, ruler and subject a relationship where the Adena being the taller people with a different phenotype ruling over the Hopewell who are of average height similar to that of today's relationship that the Watusi have with the Tutsi people in Africa and it's funny that it, in one of these accounts it goes over something related to that but my interest here is is that apparently there was this mound building culture to be found on the west coast and no mention of it and we have some very clear accounts of mound uh, burial mounds there on the west coast although they might not be uh, originally been burial mounds but because there's often this evidence of uh, secondary burials which could have been the large hominids and the native uh, peoples of the americas here so it's hard to say what they originally started as and it's over you know millennia being repurposed as secondary um, burial site. So it's, it's these things are much more complex than we can possibly realize. And to add another layer to it with the mound building culture of the West Coast, which isn't mentioned by anybody, it's completely lost and buried history. So let's get into some of these counts from Oregon because they're fascinating to me, and it's quite a few of them which are really very unusual. So. Let's talk about them. I mean, it's so interesting to me the descriptions and the observations that these people make and the brainstorming that they do to try to figure these things out, whether they're right or wrong or whatever, who knows. But you can see where, you know, it, their knowledge of things as compared to what they're finding don't line up. And they're just, you know, trying to figure out what it's all about. Walnut Grove Giant Skull two times. Unearth a giant skull. The work of removing the old Indian mound in Walnut Grove, Martins Ferry, Oregon, 
goes on slowly owing to the care exercise that none of the interesting relics to be found in it be lost. Probably the most interesting article taken from the mound is a huge skull, which would seem to indicate that in the days of the mound builders there were giants abroad. This skull is at least twice as large as the normal average of today. This skull is in good preservation from the Chicago Herald there, and that was 1893. And Again, to me, my interest is in these mounds that seem to be often associated with these um, accounts and of the, on the West Coast and apparently indicates some sort of mound building culture on the West Coast that we don't know anything about. See, so, and the uh, last accounts uh, from Washington State, there was a couple or a few in there that talked about mounds and covering mounds. And here we are in Oregon, same thing, and no mention of that in with the mound builders. Uh, who are these mound builders of the West Coast? Are they the same peoples? Are related? Or where again, more lost history that we really should know about. Okay, so here's another interesting one for you. Skeleton with horns sent to Smithsonian, and if that was the case you could kiss it goodbye. But men who have grown horns, Washington saw the recent finding in Oregon of a human skeleton with horns attached to the skull has caused much interest among anatomists generally, said a scientist of the Smithsonian Institution to a star man the other day. However, it is a fact well known to anatomists that horny excrescences upon the face and body of human subjects are by no means rare and were also known to the ancients. That woodland deity, the satyr, depicted with goat-like ears, budding horns, and short tail, did not grow altogether from the imagination of the ancients, either as to horns or tail. In the olden times, horns were symbolic of power and wisdom. Michelangelo, in his great sculpture of Moses, has given that patriarch a pair of horns symbolizing this um, uh, knowledge, power and wisdom which is also associated with the planet Saturn and uh, being the lawgiver planet, you know, like Moses was the lawgiver and appeared in the sky often looking like um, a partial moon but as a planet it looked like horns the planet Saturn and attributed to Moses the lawgiver like Kronos and Saturn is the lawgiver. Among collected examples of human grown horns in a medical museum in London there is one 11 inches long and two and a half inches in circumference. One modern investigator reports 71 cases of horns, 37 in females and 31 in males and three in infants. Of this number 15 were on the head, 8 on the face, 18 on the lower extremities and 11 on the trunk. Another collector gathered reports of 90 cases, 44 women and 39 men, the remainder infants. Of these 48 were on the head. A third collector reported 109 cases of cutaneous horns. The greater frequency of the growths is with women. Old age is often a predisposed cause. Okay, so they're often with the women and often these sort of traits are carried on the uh, female side into to future generations. So are we talking about a recessive gene or a dominant allele that was slowly disappearing and we have less of this occurring today than they had actually in the past? These are all interesting questions to ask and should be asked. The most remarkable and, you know, other anomalous things on the bodies of these uh, hominid humanoids of the past um, these other features of their anatomy and physiology could be part of the whole overall being, which is humanoid or 
you know, hominid, but more like a humanoid than a hominid, see. The most remarkable case of a horn was that of Paul Rodriguez, a Mexican porter who from the side of his head had a horn 14 inches in circumference at the base, divided into three shafts. A case is mentioned of a horn that grew oops, upon a woman's forehead 6 inches in diameter and 6 inches long. In 1696, there was an old woman in France who constantly shed long horns from her head, one of which was presented to the king. Vidal, the eminent French physician in 1886, presented before the Academy of Medicine a twisted horn 10 inches long taken from the head of a woman. Small horns growing from the tympanic membrane of the ear are not rare. Dr. Saxton of New York reported of having excised several of them. The late Dr. Dr. Pancoast of Philadelphia reported the case of a sea captain, 78 years old, who had been exposed to the winds all his, uh, all his life. His nose, cheeks, forehead, and lips were covered with horny growths, which were constantly being shed and again reproduced. A number of authorities speak of horns growing upon the legs. Among these was one over 14 inches long. This was taken from the middle of the leg of a woman 80 years old, 6 inches below the knee. The old Old women of the time of James I, King of England, who chanced to have these excrescences could hardly hope to escape burning as witches. Stories of cutaneous horns when seen and reported by the laity seldom lack exaggeration in description. One of these is a story published in papers in New South Wales, which describes a child five weeks old born with a tail 18 inches long, horns upon its forehead and a full set of teeth. The account adds that Quote, the country people around Bambala considered this child a punishment for a rebuff that the mother gave to a peddler selling pictures of the crucifixion. Vexed by his persistence, she said she would sooner have a devil in her house than his picture, unquote. So, you know, he's a very uh, colorful article there, but interesting about another one of these horned skeletal uh, skulls, skeletal remains of some sort of uh, a hominid, a humanoid that we don't know anything about from 1903 to Minneapolis Journal. There's more horned giants. Bones of an ancient giant. Bones of an ancient giant. Amazing discovery in Oregon is, is of great interest to anthropologists. The discovery of the bones of a human giant in Ellensburg is one of the most interesting anthropological finds made in the Northwest. According to L. L. Sharp, Chief of the General Land Office, quote, I just returned from Ellensburg, unquote, he said, where where I had opportunity to view the bones on earth, the skull, jawbone, thigh, and other parts of the largest skeleton indicated a man to my mind of at least eight feet high. A man of his stature and massive frame would weigh up fully 300 pounds at least. The head is one of the most remarkable I have ever studied among prehistoric skulls. It is massive with enormous brain space. While the forehead slopes down somewhat, not averaging the abrupt eminences of our present race, the width between the ears and the deep, well-rounded space at the back of the head are convincing testimony of high intelligence for a primitive man. The cheekbones are not high, like those of the Indian, nor has the head had any resemblance to the Indian skull. I am convinced that this skull is of a prehistoric man who is once a remarkable race of people who inhabited this part of America some time prior to the Indian control. The bones were uncovered fully 20 feet beneath the surface. There is then there is the usual gravel formation on top, then the conglomerate, a stratum of shale, and in a bed of concrete gravel beneath the shale were the bones of the giant and of a smaller person. The shale would indicate tremendous age, perhaps more than one million years for the deposit in which the skeleton was found, but this I deem impossible and presume that the Bones were put beneath the shale by means of a tunnel, perhaps, or, so, or some other system of internment. 
interment. I cannot think it possible that a human being of the advanced stage indicated by this great skull could have existed at the period when the shale was formed. Portland Telegram, 1912. From This is from the Lexington Gazette, taken from the Portland Telegram. So, interesting where they found it and what they considered that strata of... of uh, material in the earth there, strata, soil strata, would contain this because it was so old, but who's to say that that's incorrect, you know, we just don't know anything about the past. Not much at all. Salem skull, 25 inch circumference, which is mighty big. Discover Indian skeletons, relics on an Oregon farm. Salem, Oregon. Discovery of ancient skeletons and priceless relics in an Indian mound, another mound, at North Benton, northwest of Salem, by two Alliance Oregon mail carriers, has brought hundreds of visitors to the scene and attracted the attention of expert archaeologists. The two amateur archaeologists, Roy Saltzman and Willis McGrath, made the excavation on the farm of John Malsbury. After examining the mound, Richard G. Morgan, state archaeologist, declared that the work of the two alliance men was the most important archaeological discovery in this section of the state in recent years. Morgan said that the remains were those of Hopewell Indians. So the Hopewell in Oregon, okay, no mention of it here. I don't see Oregon here anywhere, so, you know, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Who supposedly migrated to America across the Bering Straits long before the advent of the white man. He estimated the age of the findings at more than 2,000 years old. One skeleton uncovered was that of a man, apparently a chief, estimated to have been nearly 7 feet tall, whose skull was 25 inches in circumference mighty big head. Other findings include flint arrows, the stones of three sacrificial altars, spearheads, flake knives, and beautifully wrought objects of copper. I wonder what those beautifully wrought objects of copper were and where they are now. Nowhere to be found. I don't see a date here. Let's see. Is there a date now? But it seems like an older article. Lincoln City, Oregon, eight foot black giant. So again, referring to almost like the Watusi here. Is that possible? Did they travel here across the Bering Strait or by boat as they now think? Most of the people came by boat and not across the Bering Strait. That's what the Smithsonian thinks now. That, you know, they're coming to their senses a little bit. But here's a picture of them following this black giant, eight foot black giant that they say, but it's based on the anatomy of the skeletal remains, which, you know, is something new to these people. They're trying to make sense of it, calling it black, but, I mean, should it be called black? I mean, it's just a completely different physiology and anatomy altogether. So, I just imagine, you know, again, these people are trying to figure out what it was. Thanks to bundles of information from the North Lincoln County Historical Museum, there's a pretty clear record to this intriguing mystery. According to articles archived by the museum, homesteaders who settled in the in the Lincoln City and Nesquin area had long heard legends from local tribes about a shipwreck and a mysterious black man briefly worshipped as a god. This was all the way back to the mid-1800s and just before the Calkins family started settling into the bay where the Salmon River dumps out to sea next to the Cascade Head. The son of, the, of that family, Elmer Calkins, began laying the groundwork for his own homestead near Cascade Head in 1932, according to a 1972 article in the LA Times. As he plowed the ground in 
preparation for building, he ran across something quite unusual, human bones. Elmer, according to the LA Times article, had grown up with local tribespeople all around him and he knew their ways. So what made this find even more striking was that the bones were buried with discarded seashells. So we've heard of this before in other burials with discarded seashells, so it's not unusual. This was, after all, the Indians' form of a garbage dump. So they're talking about a midden pile that the burials, but who's to say? Shells were different things to different people. Here on the East Coast, many of the native tribes considered shells as money, not midden to be thrown out to be used as decoration. This was, after all, the English form of a garbage dump. They did not bury their dead in garbage piles. That's right, they didn't. So it probably was a ceremonial burial from a far distant time than you can possibly imagine. Stranger still, one of these three skeletons was a giant. The man later discovered to be African was eight feet tall. Calkins quickly contacted historian Dr. John Horner and the local coroner, Dr. F.M. Carter. Historical from the North Lincoln County Historical Museum showed them examining the burial site. Horner took them back to the Argonne State University in Corvallis and dated the skeletons at about 160 years, which had placed them on the central Argonne coast around the late 1700s. The other two skeletons were of Caucasian men. Meanwhile, Something immediately clicked with local historians and with Calkins. They had heard many of the tales handed down from generations. The legend said the crew of the ship wandered off inland after the wreck and were never heard from again. Three stayed behind, two white men and the giant African man. In the LA Times article, Calkins vividly remembers the tale. The Indians worshipped the black giants, so the legend went, Calkins said at the time. They were in awe of the man because of his color and his size. Elmer Calkins there, 72. So he's recounting a story of a story, but it's just interesting, and who knows what, the his, what history is all about? We don't. Then the natives decided that perhaps this man was not a god, and they turned against him. Children began being born to the women with distinctly African features. When the Indians decided the giant was human, they killed him and his two shipmates, Calkins said of the legend. In a show of contempt, the bodies were thrown into kitchen middens, the piles of shells from seafood the tribes lived on. Calkins also noted that many of the local tribes people he grew up with around the turn of the century had some African features, such as dark, curly hair. Interesting enough, this wasn't Calkins' first encounter with real-life evidence of the legend. So who knows what that means. So it's an interesting story there. And, you know, being they determined the skeleton was a Negroid or whatever, I mean, you know, maybe they just, with their limited knowledge based on mainstream academics, that's all they can figure because no other types of hominids or humanoids should exist on this planet other than homo sapiens according to mainstream but as we find out from all these accounts from here and around the world that that isn't true claymath falls 12 giant indians Skeletons of giant Indians are found. Claymath Falls, Oregon, October 21st. Skeletons of 12 giant Indians, relics of prehistoric times, were uncovered by road workmen in Claymath, March Country. I guess that's what it says. In Claymath something. It became known today. One jaw bone was particularly immense size. Opinion here is divided as to whether it was an old Indian burial ground or a battleground where the Indians buried their, their killed where they fell. Many Indian relics were uncovered near the skeletons. So 12 giant Indians buried together. They don't know whether it was uh, killed or, or just simply regular burial, ceremonial burial. So, you know, they don't know, but they were giant skeletons and, um, and the relics and everything else. This is from 1915, so 20, 20th century, whatever happened to all this stuff and how giant were these Indians. So, but there's the account for you. Gladstone, Oregon Giant. 
Indian skeletons are uncovered. Demand for modern conveniences reveals sepulcher of tribe that is gone. Gladstone wants burying ground. Dead didn't have gravestones, but March of Progress has found out resting place. The dead in their gravestones laugh as they read between the born and the died or the mold of the moldering epitaph. So, uh, interesting um, uh, aphorism here. When Charles Hamilton Musgrove, a struggling newspaper reporter, wrote the lines quoted above down there in Kentucky, he little thought that they might apply to something doing or long done way out in Oregon. Where rolls the organ and hears no sound save its own dashings, yet the dead are there. Down in Gladstone Thursday, Gladstone, that city virtually made by H.E. Cross, who many years ago was the best baseball catcher in all of these parts, and is today one of the best lawyers hereabouts, the bones of a race about exterminated were uncovered. They were digging a ditch in the good town of Gladstone in which to lay pipes for water, for Gladstone is soon to have a modern water system, when they came upon the bones of men and women who once owned this whole country. Gladstone, in fact, was once a graveyard for the Clackamas Indians. O.E. Freytag told the reporter of the Morning Enterprise that his home on Arlington Street and Chicago Avenue had once been part of a great Indian cemetery. He said that several years ago, when he spaded the ground for a garden, he found the skeletons of many of the graves of the long ago. He found rare beads and many other trinkets of the tribes that owned the land. The men digging Thursday for the water plant found the skeleton of a giant. The man must have been more than seven feet tall, but he died. And then the skeleton of women and children were found. All of them lay in the same plat, and all of them had been something once. However, there were no tombstones or anything like that, and these aborigines who died thought they were going to sleep for a long time. It is doubtful if they thought their bones would be disturbed. At any rate, they did not erect tombstones to point them out, and somehow the whole thing recalls those lines of M Mr. Musgrove. One may think of them as he may. The dead in their gravestones laugh as they read between the born and the died of the moldering epitaph. So, interesting, they found these uh, large skeletal remains there, and it's interesting to me that they are often not found all that deep, whereas some of these are found extremely deep, and it just goes to show you that this history goes much further back than we can possibly imagine, and maybe much sooner than we imagine. Albany, race of great size and strength. Former finds graves of ancient race in Oregon. Albany, Oregon, March 22nd. A burial ground of what is pronounced to be an ancient group of mound builders. Mound builders, again, okay, has been unearthed directly across the river from Albany by Clyde Peacock, a farmer. Mr. Peacock made the discovery by plowing in a field which has been under cultivation for many years or many years, um, the plowshare was caught by a rock which investigation showed was a fine specimen of a mortar. Digging further, Peacock unearthed skulls, knives, skeletons, and mortars and pestles. An area of about 50 feet long and about 20 feet wide has been excavated to a depth of one and a half to two and a half feet. J.C. Crawford, local authority on prehistoric specimens, held the theory that the skeletons were buried shortly after 500 B.C. because he said about at that time, a Buddhist priest visited this coast and after returning to China to get more missionaries, came back and taught the dwellers here. After this visit by the Buddhist, Mr. Crawford says that the pestles and mortars were buried with their dead by mound builders. Upon examining some of the best specimens of bones, Mr. Crawford declared that the race had been one of great size and strength. Okay, so how bizarre is that? We just read one about a black giant being here in Oregon. Now we're talking about Buddhists that visit here and left mortars and pestles and whatnot. This is the evening, 1923, another 20th century one there. And 
how kooky is it getting now? And it just goes to show you folks, in the ancient past and in the past, many more people visited the Americas than we can possibly imagine, okay? Way before Columbus and America, Vespucci and the Vikings and the Celts and whoever it was, it didn't matter. People were coming back and forth here for millennia and more often than you think. This whole nonsense and you know, sappy, romanticized story about the explorers and the conquistas, all junk. Just throw that all away. It's like a, it's like a baby story for babies. And finally, the last one here. Pendleton, petrified giant foot. Just a foot. A petrified foot, apparently of a human giant, was dug up at Pendleton by workmen making an excavation. It was found eight feet below the surface, so eight feet below the surface. This is 1914. Just a short little article there, but it sort of demonstrates, and it should demonstrate, that guys like, you know, Mud Fossil University and other people who look at the giants and they see all these things in the landscape, the rock formations, everything, well... Maybe there's something to it, folks, you know? I mean, this seems more reasonable and rational that they found this petrified foot. I'm sure they don't give the dimensions here or anything, but again, the, and petrification itself should be re-examined too. All these things we think about, you know, that we've gone through in all these accounts, these very strange and odd observations and other things, the actual accounts, the relics and specimens found, just just lead you all over the place. And it shows how multi-layered this is and how manifold it is. You know, there's just so many layers to this to examine. And what about this mound building culture on the West Coast that we know nothing about? Maybe that's something, you know, somebody should do some sort of article or examination or study about. I don't see anything about that anywhere. And here we're looking at it on my channel here in the accounts of the giants. So just keep that in mind, guys. We're discovering some very interesting things that we didn't know about through these accounts, you see. So this is how important this series is, so... Anyway, if you like the video, please hit the like button, guys, and I hope you enjoy it. I hope everyone's doing all right and we're living through some surreal times here, but hopefully some of these videos, um, you know, sort of uh, entertain you and educate you in some way that, you know, will help us all get to the bottom of what's going on with the past here. Okay, and this is just one element of it that we don't know much about, but we put together quite a bit of it, I think, on this channel and a few other people's channels. All right, guys. Anyway, Budcat7, signing out. Peace.